So um, I'm going to begin by reading from uh, the Trump chapter of the book. It's called Trump Country. And just so you know sort of where it's situated, uh, it's uh, right after the Obama chapter, which kind of makes sense, right? Um, so Trump Country. The phrase, this is not normal, has been a nearly ubiquitous battle cry and primal scream on the left since the orange man with tiny hands was elected in 2016. Some have criticized the media for normalizing Donald Trump, a theme we will come back to in the next chapter, while others condemn Trump for his abnormal political behavior, like getting into Twitter fights with the former president of Mexico or mainstreaming white nationalism, fascism, and far-right extremism. It's undoubtedly true that Trump's lack of basic dignity and attack dog politics appear to have made him an outlier in the modern era. Even newscaster Dan Rather felt compelled to emerge from retirement to warn the American people that Trump is a monstrous abnormality. In an appearance on Conan O'Brien's late night talk show, Rather pushed back against the idea that there might be continuity between Trump's presidency and prior administrations. Conan O'Brien. We're living through a time right now where people are obsessed with our president. A lot of young people, well, people of all ages, don't know one day to the next what this man's gonna do, what he's gonna say. You have the perspective of being in the news business pretty much my entire life. You've interviewed every president, I believe, since Eisenhower. You knew them all, and I don't know if that gives you a sense of calm perspective about Trump, having talked to so many different presidents. Does it give you a sense of some kind of continuity or has everything gone haywire? Dan Rather. Well, I'm sorry, I can't do a good impression of Dan Rather. <laughs> well, <laughs> it certainly doesn't give you a sense of calmness. Um, secondly, it's important for us to remember this is not normal. There's never been anything like this before. This kind of president? Asked Conan O'Brien. No, we've had presidents, for example, who didn't like the press. We've never had one who, steadily out of his own mouth, waged such an unrelenting campaign against the press. But this is some brand new thing in American history. That's first of all. It's not normal. He continues. There's a campaign to convince people, and I think particularly young people, that, oh well, this is just the way presidencies go. That's not true. Look, many things about the age of Trump will make the stomach sicker than bad oysters. He knows how to turn a phrase. Everything from what he has to say to the way he says it, for example, trying to strike some equivalency between neo-Nazis, neo-Nazis, and other people who are trying to protest, the signals he sent to outfits such as the Ku Klux Klan, I mean, this is unprecedented in American history, and therefore, it's a dangerous time. Listen, I'm not going to sit here and act like Donald Trump is normal in the conventional sense of the word. Setting aside the fact that he's a billionaire, which materially sets him apart from the vast majority of people on the planet, he is clearly a strange, erratic, contemptible, and dangerous human being with access to enormous economic resources, political influence, and military power. But exaggerating Trump's abnormality has its own dangers, like, you know, historical and sociological inaccuracy. Portraying his belligerence toward the media as some kind of unprecedented war, based, manly, ba pardon, based mainly on the man's tweets and verbal harangues, would be laughable if it wasn't so misleading, particularly given that his direct predecessor, Barack Obama, led the most successful and devastating presidential attack on journalists and whistleblowers in modern history. It is well known among legal scholars and advocates for the free press alike that Barack Obama launched a horrifying campaign to criminalize journalistic activities, undermine First Amendment protections, and shroud government activities behind a veil of unprecedented secrecy. As a Washington Post headline declared, quote, Trump rages about leakers, Obama quietly prosecutes them. 
And through, though Obama didn't make it a daily habit to issue deranged public attacks against the press on Twitter, his administration prosecuted more leaked cases than all previous administrations combined. In 2013, James C. Goodall, the First Amendment expert and attorney who defended the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case, declared that Obama was well along the path to becoming the worst president ever on issues of national security and press freedom. Three years later, James Risen, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, summarized Obama's extraordinary attacks on civil liberties as, quote, the legal destruction of reporters' privilege. But we're supposed to clutch our pearls because Trump blubbers on about the lying media and clumsily retaliates against reporters for disparaging coverage. The second half of Dan Rather's description of Trump as an abnormal president revolves around Trump's racial politics, and this claim deserves our close attention. Despite the cowardice of white media professionals and political pundits who couldn't bring themselves to acknowledge Trump's racism, the president's proclivity for white supremacy is not a new phenomenon. In the early 1970s, Trump, his father, and their real estate company were sued by the federal government for systematically discriminating against African Americans. Undercover federal agents documented evidence of widespread bias against black prospective tenants and favoritism for whites throughout Trump's properties. Former employees testified that they'd been instructed to restrict rentals to Jewish people and executives while they were discouraged from renting to African Americans. By 1989, Trump was taking out full page ads in four different New York City newspapers, publicly calling for the execution of the Central Park Five. Though the men were later exonerated by DNA evidence and paid $41 million by, the New, York, by New York City for wrongful imprisonment, Trump still insists to this day that they're guilty. It's worth noting that Trump's long history of racial animus did not prevent him from embracing wealthy people of color, from Oprah to Jennifer Hudson, or from landing a gig as a reality TV host on NBC's The Apprentice. His racism, sexism, and all around lack of decency didn't seem to be much of a concern for Bill and Hillary Clinton, who maintained a friendly, if transactional, relationship with the Donald for many years. By the time Trump informally launched his political career, by inventing the racist birther mythology, accusing Barack Obama of being a non-citizen, he'd already established himself as a despicable human being. As David Leonard tweeted, quote, Donald Trump has been obsessed with race for the entire time that he's been a public figure. Attempts by journalists to compile definitive lists of examples of Trump's racism have to be updated almost daily. We're talking about a man who began his presidential campaign by stigmatizing Mexican immigrants with every racist trope imaginable, smearing them as drug dealers, rapists, killers, and murderers. Not only did he draw a moral equivalency between racist and anti-racist protesters in Charlottesville, but he also referred to white supremacists as very fine people. He campaigned for Roy Moore, pro-slavery Alabaman, accused of sexually assaulting teenage girls, and he pardoned Sheriff Joe, Ap I cannot say his name, Arpaio, my throat doesn't like it, <laughs> a lawless white supremacist who racially profiled and brutally tortured people of color, including women of color in Arizona. We haven't even gotten to Trump's Muslim ban or his reprehensible shithole comments. Representative Frederica Wilson of Florida was right to describe Trump's White House as full of white supremacists. He's hired multiple racist and fascist sympathizers in his administration, including Steve Bannon, his former chief advisor. In addition to his previous stint at the helm of Breitbart News Network, an established cesspool of anti-Semitism, white supremacist racism, anti-blackness, and, and Islamophobia, Bannon has repeatedly declared his admiration for anti-Semites and white supremacists. And under Trump's presidency, the United States became one of only three countries in the world to vote against a UN resolution 
signed by 131 nations denouncing Nazism. All of this cozying up to white supremacist thugs and neo-Nazis is obviously alarming and reprehensible to anyone with a functioning moral compass. But is it really, as Dan Rather suggests, unprecedented in American history? Only in your dreams. The history of the United States actively recruiting, employing, and arming everyone from actual Nazis and perpetrators of the Holocaust to dictators, war criminals, and terrorists across the globe is harrowing. It's also a history that's essentially unknown to the vast majority of US citizens. Consider Operation Paperclip, the formerly classified program in which the United States violated its own official policy of denying citizenship to Nazis, and instead welcomed more than 1,500 German scientists and their family members, including people directly responsible for war crimes during the Holocaust, and hired them to work on government projects in the aftermath of World War II. In addition to hiring Nazis for their expertise, US officials helped whitewash their war, their war crimes, create new identities, and revive their reputations. Perhaps the most famous German scientist recruited by the United States was Dr. Werner von Braun, a committed member of the SS, the Nazi paramilitary organization, a weapons producer for Hitler, and a card-carrying Nazi who built the world's first ballistic missile with slave labor from concentration camps. Von Braun went on to become the celebrated rocket scientist for the US Army and the first director of the Marshall Space Flight Center at the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Authorized by Harry Truman, Operation Paperclip stretched from 1945 until at least 1990, meaning that no less than nine presidential administrations were involved in the government's secret partnership with Nazi researchers, engineers, and scientists. Let me say this again. Nine different US presidents quite literally facilitated the normalization of Nazis. But wait, there's more. While our white male political leaders were happy to hire Nazis at the end of the war, they refused entry to thousands of European Jews fleeing the Nazi regime. To take just one example, in 1939, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declined to take action and allow the St. Louis, a ship carrying more than 900 Jewish refugees, to land in the United States. The desperate passengers were forced to return to wartime Europe, and 278 of those aboard were murdered during the Holocaust. But wait, there's more. Just three years after rejecting Holocaust refugees, FDR signed Executive Order 9066 in February 1942, thereby initiating the racist policy euphemistically known as the internment of Japanese Americans. As a result of white supremacist hysteria, more than 100,000 Japanese Americans, children included, were rounded up without legal hearings or trials, Forcibly removed, forcibly removed from their homes, and relocated to 10 different concentration camps scattered throughout California, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Idaho, and Arkansas. More than 60% of those incarcerated were born in the United States. Historian Roger Daniels has described the racially motivated incarceration as an attempt at ethnic cleansing. Officially, Roosevelt and military officials rationalized their racist policy with the now familiar excuse of national security. Japanese Americans were described as an enemy race and an existential threat to the nation's wartime effort, despite the lack of any evidence whatsoever of disloyalty or espionage among Japanese Americans as a whole. Of course, as you know, German Americans and Italian Americans were never treated similarly or sequestered in concentration camps during the war. Gee, I wonder why. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit to the end of this section. Focusing on the racism in, of individual presidents, whether it's Donald Trump or Richard Nixon, obscures the bigger, more ominous picture, the systematically racist society from which they emerged. Trump is not some kind of alien creature that came here from outer space. His brand of crude white supremacy resonates 
with tens of millions of US citizens, as well as white nationalists and neo-Nazis across the globe, because his views align with many of the foundational principles upon which Western colonial expansion broadly, and the United States specifically, were established. And the issue here is not just that our nation's founding principles were explicitly white supremacist, xenophobic, and imperialist. It's that these principles have been actively maintained, institutionalized, and normalized for generations. The white supremacist in chief is a uniquely ugly and unseemly politician, but in many ways, we have always lived in Trump country. Thank you. So, um, what we're going to do now is have a conversation. Um, you know, the book, I'll just tell uh, those of you who haven't had a chance to pick it up yet, uh, it opens up with, um, you know, some background chapters on basic concepts and critical race theory, breaking it down in everyday language. Um, and, you know, how did we get here? What's the history of, of white supremacy? Um, and then it transitions. There's a chapter called Listen to Black Women. Uh, a lot of people are asking me about it this, these days because of Serena Williams. A lot of people talking about intersectionality and misogynoir. Um, and then, like, the heart of the book, like you heard a little bit from the Trump chapter, but it's about politics. Uh, there's a chapter called Racial Stupidity in the Obama era. Uh, I can't even say it, Obama era, because I was so wrapped up with Obama uh, in that first campaign, like in love with the man. Uh, and so that chapter is about how I started out as a really conventional Democrat, and then really in his second term, particularly in the context of Black Lives Matter, and my own learning of critical race theory and integrating it into my research, that it became much more... Um, just really depressed with our racial politics. And so then we go from that chapter to Trump. There's a chapter on um, racism in the media, call it fake racial news, uh, and uh, a chapter called Interracial Love 101, which is about misconceptions about, uh, you know, uh, the way to end racism is just, you know, for us to love and fuck each other or something across the color line. Uh, and uh, so that's a little bit of an overview of what the book is about. Um, race, politics, history, sociology, um, personal reflections, uh, thinking about how racial stupidity is the direct result of living in a racist society, and that's not by mistake. Uh, the reproduction of racial ignorance reinforces the racial status quo. So with that, I'll turn it over to Morgan and Maryam um, and see where this conversation takes us. Okay. Um, one of the things I wanted to talk about was your introduction to France. Um, the reason why I wanted to talk about it is because a lot of times in black American history, it was seen as a place of refuge for many different artists um, who wanted to go there to escape the racism of America. And it's, it very, it, uh, it's very easy to sort of idealize that there's someplace better than here. And so, I want to talk about it because you know we follow each other on Twitter, and um, Dr. Fleming, Crystal was talking about Portugal's history. Oh, white Portuguese supremacy. trolls are still oh in my, my mentions. God, they are yeah. still it mad was, at me. It was really bad, and they were oh like, God. "Oh, we we abolished slavery before everybody else." They also got involved in it before everybody else. Yeah. They started the shit. Right. So I want to talk to you yeah. about that as someone who is a Black American woman, speaks French. You go over you there, too. yeah, Among but not, not as not not as much not as good as you. Um, but go over there, and you're initially enamored with you know the the, the upper echelon society that you get ingratiated into. Mm. But then through the politics mm. and through research and more, that sort of rose-colored mm -hmm. vision dissolves. Yeah. So a little bit of context for for, for the rest of y'all um, who don't know me. So I mentioned the Obama chapter. Uh, I got involved with Obama's presidential campaign when I was actually living in Paris. I was in France to work on my dissertation, which was about the legacies of colonialism and slavery in France and uh, focusing on how black activists in particular, French Caribbeans, understood their history, their identity in relation to present day racism and so on. Um, and uh, I got there, I got to Paris in like uh, October 2007 
And pretty quickly, I tell the story in the Obama chapter how I got swept up in this group of black expats. I mean, I think for people who know about France, you're aware that there's a history of African Americans going to Paris and seeming to have a pretty good time, you know, and be, you know, being embraced. And I have to say, you know, the French, they also embraced me. You know, they treated me quite well. Um, and I think that comes through in the opening pages. Like, I was living my best life, I thought, at the time. Um, but, you know, I didn't have entirely rose-colored glasses, if only because I was specifically there to study French racism. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, I didn't yet have a global critique of white supremacy. So I did not go to France feeling like, oh, I'm, I'm entering into a context also of white supremacy. I didn't even feel that way about the United States, right? I was familiar with, with the stuff. I had been studying racism, but the people I studied did not frame racial oppression, even in terms of oppression, it was just racism and anti-racism. Mm -hmm. Racism and anti-racism, that's what I went to France to study. Um, and it was over time, you know, that my naivete about Obama, about France, about all this stuff began to, you know, um, you know disintegrate. But uh, for me, I think what was important about going to France was really to see the contrast between the way French black people and other minorities are treated and to this day, African Americans are treated because um, in my first book, it's called Resurrecting Slavery, I talk about, it's about France, but I talk about African American privilege abroad, uh, which can sound like a contradiction in terms, um, and I'm not talking about, is it Charlemagne the God who had something called black privilege, it's not exactly yeah, the same, yeah. um, but the idea that because of France's desire to sort of one-up the United States and prove we're not as racist as the United States. Uh, that's part of how we get treated, um, African Americans. And also, as long as you go to France and you don't really care too much about the French minorities, you'll be treated quite well. You'll be treated quite well if you don't care. And if you, and if you look a certain way, and if you have uh, class access. And so all kinds of things helped me. I had. Uh, you know, my Harvard affiliation, I had the, the rich expats uh, who were helping me. Um, my skin tone helped me. Uh, colorism is global. France is a kind of society where they're looking for a reason to whiten you. So, you know, I had people, French people, who would insist, you have a white parent, don't you? Which one of your parents is white? And I don't. Both of my parents are uh, African American, um, and neither one of them are you know, our family histories are mixed, but neither one of them are biracial even. Uh, so yeah, you know, being really clear that I was experiencing privilege, and if I didn't care what was happening to French black folks and other people of color, I could have made a life there. I had a job offer, I could have, you know, just left the whole thing behind. Uh, but I was always just sort of confronted with my own disgust about France's racial denial, and then certainly about my own country's racial denial, yeah. I mean, what's your experience when you've, you've traveled extensively? Yeah, the, uh, the same thing happened when I went to Japan. Yeah. I mean, when I went to Japan, I thought, well, I thought that I sort of got rid of the psychological toll of being African American. Oh, you did? Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. yeah, when I went there, I was happy. <laughs> like, I was oh, yeah. just. You, you write about that. I yeah. was just, so, in my book I wrote about it, I was a foreigner. I didn't feel, oh, this sounds really bad, but. Go ahead, say it. And I was like, I didn't feel black or as black as I did in America. America, also because I spoke the language. Yeah. So I was like, I just got to get where I need to go. I can do this. I can handle it. Yeah. But uh, towards the end of my time there, that's when the verdict came, the George Zimmerman verdict came back. And man, that just ruined everything. Like the last week of my trip, I could not sleep. I right. had to sleep with like the lights on. It was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. um, how it got, but it just made me realize that like, wake up, like yeah. you can't, you can't escape. separate, you can't escape. Um, and I think it's this sort of romantic idea. I see it all the time on Twitter and, you know, talking to friends, it's like, where can I go yeah. that it can be less racist than here? And I'm like, like, I, I don't know. I don't know that, you know, less for me doesn't make sense. It's different flavors of racism. Well, yeah. That's, right? It's, yeah. And it's like, what can you put up with? Like, I, I know French black folks who um, have a better time in the United States than they do in their own country. And it's not because they say the United States is not racist. They just don't have to put up with French racists. And there's a difference for them. Um, 
it, it's, it's complicated. It's like you try and make your life and negotiate with oppression as you, as you can, but there's no utopia for sure. But I also think Wakanda messed us up. Like when Black Panther came, came out and was like, Wakanda, like, we going to Wakanda, y'all. Like, there ain't no Wakanda. <laughs> like, I'm trying, Unfortunately, trying to have yeah. a good time, but it's not, there, there's no Wakanda over here. Yeah. Um, and, but it keeps being reimagined in different ways, right? In our writing or just having these, you know, mundane yeah. conversations. Like, I want to I wanna leave. Yeah. I want to escape. Um, which is it, normal. Which is normal. <laughs> Who doesn't want to escape, you know, escape state violence and stigmatization and all of that? But that goes yeah. back to what we were talking about, you know, behind the scenes there, just global critique. Yeah. You know, I think oftentimes if you don't have the type of, you know, training that you have or you don't read a lot, it's very easy to think yeah. of your own particular privileges and your own particular, you know, you know circumstances, yeah. right? Thank you. And then tying into something big, it can almost be too much. And it's very hard to like level it out and be, and, and, and still have hope. Mm. But be like when you realize there's really no place to go where there's, you know, no oppression. Like yeah, that's, that doesn't yeah, exist. Yeah, but I, yeah. And then I think it also ties in, you know, talking about the Obama administration, right? Yeah. You know, I had a question and I, I think I'm, I'm just excited talking about this book, but I, I had a question about when you wrote your critiques of a President Obama, because now we live in this, yeah. you know, hellfire of an administration that you argue, and I agree with that, it, it had, I mean, it's always been bad, but we're trying to look to the past, or like this romantic nostalgia that things were better. And you're like, well, no, it wasn't, but did you ever, did you have any moments when you were writing that chapter, like, oh, people gonna come after me for this? Like, I'm, do I need to go there? <laughs> um. I mean, I have been tweeting a lot of this stuff for a long time, you know, so a lot of the book also comes from, you know, things I had begun, begun to tweet, things that I had already written about in the public sphere, and people had already come for me. So people come for me regularly, right? Like, people block me. People, you know, get upset. Um, so, but I think the question for me, um, Morgan, was who's going to publish this? You know, not that there aren't, you know, publishers of, of political, you know, books and controversial books, but it's like on the left or the so-called left, the people who act like they're left, but they're really centrist um, and they're really corporate uh, and they're really conventional. I really wonder, like, who is going to, you know, embrace this? Um, and so I think it's, it's, you know, it's not for nothing that uh, Beacon Press is an independent publisher. Um, you know, and I was very uh, interested in their politics and the articulation between our, but I can say, you know, even there, you know, uh, strategically, you know, the question of which chapter do you show first, you know, um, and all I can say is uh, my editor uh, at Beacon, Gayatri, she's the director of the press, uh, Gayatri um, Petnik, she's the director of, of the editorial department, and she, from, from the jump, she was like, I'm down. Um, and she was extremely supportive. Um, and also, you know, the whole editorial team just really embraced the politics of the book. So for me, that was super important. Also, Beacon is like, you know, it was an entirely, the whole editorial team was women of color. Um, so it's, you know, and that matters too, so. Um, so I really enjoyed this book. Mainly, you know, your voice in it is a conversational voice. Um, and it's not an academic book right. to talk about topics that are often considered in an academic forum. So I thought, to me, it was really a joy to read for that reason. But I was thinking a lot about the fact that you are super honest in the book about your own kind of late comingness to these ideas. Very late, really, honestly, if you think about the fact that you really came to consciousness after you had gotten a PhD and were already oh, yeah. working yeah. Um, in this area. <laughs> um, I, more, I, w I kept thinking to myself in contrast to that kind of how you came to consciousness around race and gender and the kind of intersections about the fact that I was um, already very conscious of race very early on. Like I had a race consciousness and a race analysis when I was in my teens. Mm -hmm. Had already begun organizing at that point. Um, 
and I just thought about the fact that I think because you came to these issues later, there's a lot of compassion for other people in the book, and that if I had written this book, it would not have been as compassionate <laughs> at all. Like, and I do think that there's, a, there's kind of a, 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 a thing about like being conscious that it took time for you to get it, so you're more compassionate to others who might be late. Mm. You know what I mean? It comes through in the book, whether or not that was what it's you funny intended. funny that you read it that way. It is what I intend, but, you know, I, I can't help it. I've already looked at some of the reader reviews, you know. Yeah. And some, some of the white folks are like, you know, she's screaming through the whole book, you know. And, of course, if you never, you know, call out white supremacy, you know, a whisper sounds like a scream. Yeah. Um, you know, if you live your life ignoring it and benefiting from it, then someone says something, it's like, oh, shit. Yeah. But, but it was my intention. Yeah, it so, through really clearly. And I was just contrasting that with like my posture in the world yeah. being much less, I'm not interested in teaching people anything that way. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it's, I think it's by virtue of like 30 years of already having processed and shit and yeah. seeing people who should know better by now still yeah. not know better. So like, you know, I, I appreciated your book for its potential for hope in the end even not, not from like a Pollyannish view at all, not from a sense that we're gonna end oppression tomorrow, the belief that oppression may continue for generations to come, but there's still something to do in the now. Mm -hmm. I think I appreciated, I appreciated all those aspects of things and, um, and how to try to navigate this particular moment when we are living in a time, you read a piece about Trump and this consciousness of normality versus is this something abnormal we should be calling out more vociferously? Clearly, people are getting, the, for the people who are just getting politicized, now is the worst time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it now is that moment of like, holy shit, this is a racist country. And, they're, like, and so people have to have compassion for that moment mm -hmm. and be able to like, meet people where they are for real. Because mm -hmm. for them, if you're 19, this is the worst it's been. Mm -hmm. If you're 24, it might still have been the worst. You know, you had Obama, years of post-racial mm -hmm. bliss for many people, right? That's the, the narrative that's been told was that we had racial progress and we were heading to like the nirvana of the universe, utopia land of non-racism. Wakanda. And, right, uh, and now, not Wakanda, the not complete Wakanda. opposite of that. <laughs> but like we were, we were going to this other world and now all these people got like water in their face that actually, you know, racial progress comes with racist progress. Mm -hmm. Like, there, it comes at the same exact moment. So we're in the racist progress angle of things, but that's always been with racial progress. With racial progress, we've, always had, we've had backlash to that from yeah. the beginning and the inception of this country. So I, I've been really, like, the book really had me thinking so many different kinds of things about compassion, about thinking about hope in the midst of a very difficult moment of, you know, of struggle. Thinking about, again, racial progress versus racist progress. Thinking about all these things together in a very accessible way. So I just wanna thank you for taking that, you know, leap and doing that, because it's not an easy thing to accomplish in anywhere, not even just the book, but in general. Thanks for so, saying yeah. that. Um, Mariam, I would say that, um, yes, there's compassion there, but there's also a lot of wig snatching. There's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of me being like, what the fuck is wrong with people? So for me, it's actually both. Like I, I feel both of, like I feel outraged about people not realizing things. And then I catch myself because I remember I didn't realize it until a few years ago or whatever, a decade ago, I had this realization that I'm like, you know, but I feel like that's part of you know, it's a human thing that I think is really um, uh, problematic, that folks get just so caught up in their self-righteousness and never do the next step of, of acknowledging, wait, I wasn't born, you know, even if you were, what, 10 yeah. or 15, yeah. 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 you know, it's not like you an embryo, yeah. you know, it took time, right? right. But so, you know, many people don't catch themselves and say, well, shit, like I remember actually when I didn't have the realization. But I think both of those things are necessary. I think it's absolutely appropriate to express outrage that we are so long in our ignorance, that we are so long in our not knowing and not wanting to know. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the times people just don't want to know. It's not a matter of even not knowing, That's right. as we were talking about earlier. But I think, you know, coming back to, because it's also judgment of myself. Mm -hmm. 
some, some of the people who have read the book have said that they sense that, you know, that I'm, I don't know that I'm apologetic, but I'm like, shit, like, you know, you know, I could have, I could have ended up like, you know, what's his name? Who's in, um, who's in, you know, Ben Carson or something, yeah. Omarosa <laughs> or something. I was on a, a wrong path, you know, and the woke angels intervened and they're still intervening because I'm still, you know, it's not like, oh, I have arrived, yeah. you know, I'm still learning, you know. I have a question about bandwidths because, you know, you're talking about the different, levels of compassion or lack thereof. And so, you know, when the whole Serena Williams tennis match happened, yeah. I saw a tweet by um, a white female actress who said, oh, this is the most bi like racist thing ever. And I was like, I'm gonna Google this person's <laughs> age. So I Googled her age and she was born in 1968. She was born two years after my mother. Oh, wow. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So I quote tweeted her and I was like, okay, with all due respect, you have not been paying attention. If you think that this is the most racist thing, then man, I got, I got so much to show you. I'm so excited. And I was like, I need to know, but um, as black women who do impart so much knowledge to all of us, you might have white people or people of color that are like asking questions but because you have this experience of doing this for so long, you might be like, I don't want to answer that question, but then it might come to you. And you're like, oh, actually, I will. No, I'm going to send you them somewhere else. Oh, you're going to send them somewhere else? Because <laughs> we, oh. we all have our, our limits of what, like, I am going to talk about this or I'm not going to talk about that. Because so, like, for example, I have you all read White Fragility yet by Robin DiAngelo? I haven't yet. So I, when I read that book, which is also published by Beaker Press, it, very, it was very clear to me that she was writing in a tone that I didn't have time to write in. As a black woman, like I'm not like, she was like way more compassionate than I am in my book. I was like, okay, this is white woman's work to do it in this way. And I'm not gonna do that. And it's also like different things can be said by different people in different right. registers. And, and differently. Right, and, and it Absolutely. resonates differently and it's heard differently. And we don't all have to have the same register. Like could somebody, you know, be someone who, you know, couches their critique of systemic racism in a certain way that resonates with an audience. And that audience might be outraged by the way I package it. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's fine. Like we need to have different voices and we need to say different things. Um, and sometimes the context is also gonna shape what we say and what we're, sometimes it depends on what mood I'm in. You know, who has gotten on my nerves today? Do I have time to, <laughs> to deal with this bullshit right now or not, right? Well, and I think the expectation is for black women to continuously caretake, nurture, teach, and be gracious and lovely about it all the time. Like, you know, don't raise your voice while you do it. If you say no, there's much more of a willingness to keep asking you over and over again. When white men say no, people don't ask them again. You know, there's just, there's just a thing about like no with authority and it's like, keep it moving, you know? When I say no, it's are you sure? Maybe, can I, all right, is it moment? You know, like there's just a, a kind of a willingness to constantly ask for more. Um, and so in a way, I think, you know, your chapter on listen to black women um, speaks to this in some ways around the contributions that black women have made to our understanding of white supremacy is to understand the kind of intersectionality of uh, oppression uh, and, uh, and the ways in which we are positioned at particular points to take the burdens of that discrimination very differently and experience it differently. I think that um, it's very difficult as a black woman who has taught and when you're a teacher, you know, you, you know this as a teacher, when you're in front of a classroom, your expertise is always questioned. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's like a threshold of knowing and knowledge mm -hmm. that you get called on that your white colleagues do not, mm. that white men certainly don't. Their expertise is taken as for granted. Mm -hmm. Of course they know their thing. You, you get pushed in different ways mm -hmm. to see how much you know. Mm -hmm. And if that's mm -hmm. really relevant. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And, you know, as somebody who's taught at elite universities, you know, you know what that's, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of that sense of uh, always having to be mm -hmm. proving yourself mm -hmm. as expert, mm -hmm. but also needing to also be in a, mo in a moment of delivering things in the appropriate way mm -hmm. so as to be able to be heard. Mm -hmm. 
it's exhausting. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just really exhausting on a regular level. And I just, you know, I, I, I wonder about like in this moment of listen to black women, I'm always like, it's not really, it's not listen to our intellectual production. Uh. It's listen to our, I don't know. It, it, it just feels more pop culture-ish. Yeah than to me than it does about like that you have an intellectual framework knowledge, yeah. and no and knowledge born of not just experience yeah. of study yeah. that deserves its own heft yeah. and seriousness to be engaged in the world in yeah. real ways like nobody's gonna accuse dr davis of not having been learned a learned person who has studied in Germany, has a philosophy PhD. You know, it's yeah. not, she's not just coming out there to speak about the latest clothes trends right. based on her experience of those clothes. Right. But that's where we're most comfortably placed. Right. Not as an intellectual right. powerhouse right. Right. who can transform the way we see the world. Um, and so I think, you know, there's some parts in your book where you really speak to that and speak to your own dismissal initially of black women's intellectual labor. Of and black work, feminism. Of black feminism, right? Yeah. And, and of people then, your, it was a student of yours who was kind of like, you should reread this, right? Yeah, and, so I, yeah. I, talk, I talk about um, many experiences. So I just want to flip back to compassion and then come back to this question of like black women's epistemic authority and how it doesn't get recognized. But I feel like, okay, compassion is important to me. It's part of my spirituality, so on and so forth. But for me, as a sociologist, I'm really interested in the conditions of knowledge production. So I'm really interested also in what explains how we know what we know, why we don't know what we need to know, and, and how turning points can be produced. Um, I don't know, I know as an organizer, you're in the business in some respect in creating, right, those uh, turning points and consciousness raising. Uh, very explicitly, and I think you know everybody needs to learn from organizers about just that. Um, but so to go back to um, this question of, of black women not being recognized as bearers and producers of knowledge, you know this is part of how I was trained, and I write about that. Right, this is part of the conditions of my uh, training at Harvard, the Department of Sociology. We were not educated in a way that would center black women's knowledge barely white women for that matter. But it was so, and, and I, rem I write about in the book how there was a, another uh, black student at the time who was like, you know, we were working on a research project about racism and she was trying to get everybody to listen to black women and say, maybe we can bring in intersectionality. And I was like, yeah, sure. I wasn't saying no. I was like, yeah, yeah, sure. But I wasn't pushing for it. And the professors involved just kept like, yeah, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. Years go by, years go by. There's no getting to it. Right, and so the casual dismissal of black women's knowledge is something that I woke up to rather late in the game, and it was only after I started my job at Stony Brook, uh, like seven years ago, like the first year I started you know, teaching, that I began to be more critical about that. It's not that I didn't care at all about intersectionality or black feminist thought, but I didn't really understand what was at stake. And so as I learned about and became critical of the way I was trained. I was like, oh shit. You know, I've been trained in a way that even undermines my own authority. What the fuck? Right? So, yeah. Do we, maybe, yeah, we got people here. Um, time. Did they, did they pass around question cards or are we taking questions from the audience? How are we doing? Okay. Does anyone have questions? Don't be afraid. <laughs> Nobody's going to bite your head. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, so I'm, I have a question in reference to what you were, uh, when you were reading the excerpt earlier. You said at one point the country that we are founded on, or there was some use of the word that, yeah, America is still your country. So. I mean, I am Palestinian. I just, uh, I was living in Jerusalem for a while. We would, and I'm, my, I was born and raised in the U.S. And I found the experience there is very similar to what I understand of the, of the black American experience here. Why, the Palestinian would never use that term. We would never look at ourselves within the larger body politic of Zionism or Israel. And say we. Yeah, I mean, it would be them. So it's interesting that it's still, and I mean, that, that might just be the nature of like, what, I mean, what are the options, right? 
America is America. Like, what what are what what are the <laughs> what are the methods of resistance that are kind of outside of within the kind of American mainstream? It's like we are an American uh, a segment within the U.S. I don't know. So I don't know if you had any comments on that or. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's complicated because, I mean, we could talk about Du Bois and double consciousness, so we could have a sociological conversation about it, where uh, W.B. Du Bois, you know, wrote very cogently about, you know, this bifurcated consciousness that is endemic to what he called the Negro experience, but what it means to be a Negro or a black person in this country. On the one hand, we built this country, and our um, forced inclusion in the American project, first through forced, uh, you know, kidnapping and, and bondage and, and slavery under racial capitalism, right? We didn't have a choice. My ancestors didn't have a choice in that. Um, but then those who survived and their descendants, right? Many have remained, most have remained and grappled with how to acknowledge their buying into the American project, and yet also being systematically violated and denigrated and desecrated by that project. Um, so I would say, you know, as long as I'm still a US citizen uh, and I pay taxes and I work and teach in this country, it would be delusional for me to not use the word we at times. Um, now, when I teach about systemic racism in my classes, um, sometimes I take on the theatrical we, which is when I'm talking about the founding fathers, for example, and I talk about what, you know, white male supremacists who founded this country. When I say we, my students know I'm being facetious and I'm trying to get them to be critical of, wait, that's a black woman professor talking who obviously wasn't a white male supremacist <laughs> slave owner, right? And that's also like for me a, a way of like having a, a cognitive you know, moment of dissonance for people to say, oh, wait a second, who was left out and who wasn't, you know, included from the start intentionally for the purpose of building wealth for people socially defined as white and particularly white men. Um, so the we is, you know, part of the political reality, right? And I mean, yeah, my ancestors built this country. I think that, I think also the point being made that needs to come, that the entire history of black blackness in America has been that question of, of kind of being an internal colony and also laying claim to this quote land, even though it's settler colonial, a settler colonial project yeah. that we were forced into. Yeah. There is still like, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, one of the, fir the first black newspaper in the US was, came out of here, uh, out of New York. Um, it was called the Freedom Journal. And uh, the two editors of that piece, Samuel Cornish and another guy named Russ Worm, uh, they basically, both these men, they were both black men, had a, like the reason they only lasted two years, basically, they started the newspaper in 1827, folded in 1829, was because they disagreed vehemently about whether it would ever be possible for black people to be able to live in this country without racism. So, Cornish was like, we gonna die here. Mm -hmm. My people were brought here, literally his father had been enslaved. So he's like, I'm not going anywhere. The US owes us reparations and they owe us. We deserve to be here. And he was gonna fight for that. Russell was like, um, yeah, the first college graduate. He was the first black college graduate in the history of the US, mm -hmm. okay? He graduated from Bordeaux. And he was like, um, we need to get the fuck out of this country because they're never going to give us what we want. They're never going to give us respect. We're never going to not be black N-words. And he left and went to Liberia when the colonization society was able to buy that land and in order to ship all the black folks out of the country, right? Something that Lincoln and other people had been proponents of. He left the country. He dies in Liberia. In Liberia two very different concepts of blackness playing out within two people who were good friends and collaborators. That's been the history of American blackness. That's, that's, that's our fight has been that all along the way. Stay or go. And we've never been able to reconcile that because people have very different stakes in the game. 
and people have very different ideological beliefs about what America actually means, what its meaning is. If you help build something and then you go away from it, you've been exiled for many people. And who wants to be in exile? You would know this, you know? In terms of Palestinian people, I've been to Palestine, I have friends who are Palestinians who feel on their own land that they've been literally exiled out of the country, they have to go to Jordan and other places to live. Who wants that? They're still longing to go back to what they see as their homeland, the place of origin, the place where people spilt their blood, made the world. So many uh, black, Afric black Americans have only the US as that home. Africa is not home. There's no longer that connection there of a direct tie to the land. It's complicated, but I think, yes, that's part of why the we is a royal we, because it's like, we're not gonna be, you're not gonna throw us out of our own house. This is a house we help build. And I think there is a significant difference between the political situation of indigenous people in the United States and African Americans. I think there's a, an easier parallel between the Palestinian situation and indigenous people, just starting with settler colonialism. That's very different from the situation of African Americans. So there's, there's a more natural political way in which to be black in this country, as Du Bois talked about in terms of being a Negro, is to have that weakness, that, that, that partial inclusion and exclusion within the American project um, and, in a way that doesn't make as much sense for indigenous people right. who are still the victims of settler colonialism, right? Oh, I was going to, it's hard to follow back from <laughs> yesterday. Yes. I was like, damn. You get an amen, I maybe like, amen. Um, but I will say, even on, just not even talking about the larger body politic, sometimes when I'll talk to older black people, they'll use that they in a way that like, oh, they did this. But then that also takes away responsibility. Who's they? Are you trying to say white people? And I would have these conversations with black people. Like I had to travel across the country for my book research and it would always say they, like they, because it was like this dichotomy between what has been taken from us, this sort of exile within the lands that you built, but at the same time, not giving responsibility to the people who did that, even when you know they did it, even when you're in these like you safe mean not spaces. not naming them? Is yeah, that what you mean? Yeah, not even yeah. saying white people, just saying like they. And I'm supposed to know because I'm black, yeah. but still I'm like, why can't you say white people? Like they, they, did, they did do this, right? And then when you fish it out of them, they're like, yeah, they did. I'm like, well, then why don't you say it then? You know, it's almost like this yeah. fear, even with the pronoun situation, to say that. To I'm glad get, you, yeah. you mentioned that because part of what I talk about in the book is how people will talk about racism but not white supremacy as the it's, system that we live and in. And if you see headlines sometimes, they'll be like, black boy was shot by crap, someone. With someone. And it's like, who's the agent? Right. Like, who, who did right. that? And it'll be like passive yeah. form. Exactly. And I'm like, why are you, somebody did that to that person. Say who did that. Why do you have to leave it out? It's, I, I hate that. <laughs> I mean, it's a huge yeah. mechanism by which we reproduce racial ignorance. If you don't yeah. name who benefits from and maintains the system, then it's easier to mystify it and, 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 and perpetuate it. I think we got through one question. We got one Why question. Good, Is there any other question? It was a good one. Yes. Do you have a dissertation you're about to have? Uh, right, well, a I have an agreement, actually. Okay, yes. So, like, when you're talking about traveling, so um, I write, I sort of blog, and I've been struggling with a piece uh, about a road trip I recently took to explore my new state, Arizona. Wow. Joy. Arizona, wow. It, it was beautiful. <laughs> but part of the piece was talking about how for five years I just did not feel the vibe to travel. Um, whereas I think for most of my adult life, I've traveled out of the country at least once a year. Okay. So when I th when you're talking about uh, the issues in France and uh, not feeling black in Japan, I th I the two my two last travels in 2012 and 2011 were uh, Israel and Poland, and those were oh, wow. two of the most difficult places I have ever been because I felt such explicit racism. That, uh, now, now mind you, Israel was a church trip. <laughs> so I was there to see the Holy Land. And I was just like, wow, this is not the Holy Land I expected to see, <laughs> you know? And um, Poland was- I'm just curious, can I ask, did they have you speak to any, any Palestinians during the church no, trip? No, of course not. Did they interrogate your opponent in the country? 
Um, I, no, I think I sort of got through that through some intermediary. Yeah. yeah. I've, I've been to Israel, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, um, Poland was an academic trip um, through my graduate program, and it was the most racist experience I have ever had in my life through the professors. <laughs> so, um, and I think, like, when, I'm, when I was trying to get through this blog, which I still haven't written fully, it's, it's left a sort of trauma there, you know? So it's like, you know, I've traveled a great deal, but my last two big trips were uh, very discouraging experiences. And so when you think about where can we go, and this thought actually crossed my mind today, because I was like, Rwanda, they're rebuilding. <laughs> you know, let me, maybe, maybe an African country in the countryside would be nice, who knows, right? But um, I chose Arizona. <laughs> but it's not too late to leave the country. But it's, it's interesting when you think about that as a black woman, you know, where can we go? Where are we appreciated? And I would say, like you, I, I did a semester in Paris in undergrad, and they embraced me. Like, to mm -hmm. this day, I'm like, I, I know if I really, really, really. You could go. I, exactly. You speak and English. Embrace. Huh? You speak English. I, yeah, I speak exactly. English. English you have with your an American passport. accent. <laughs> your your American yeah. American. Oh, absolutely, you. absolutely. Yeah. But there's but there's an appreciation. But you also see what they don't like about Algerians and other yeah. people of color and so forth. So that that does have an impact after a while. Yeah. So I just wanted to say, completely agree with the yeah. experiences. And well, I was gonna say like I've been to Russia. So when I heard that, I was like, oh, like I just because. And I wrote about it in my book. I didn't want to go there to be appreciated. I was just trying to learn Russian. <laughs> and I got into the program. I went into my professor's office. And one woman was sitting on the right of me. The, he was sitting across me. And he told me, listen, he said, Russia has the highest concentration of neo-Nazis in the world. If you don't want to go, we understand. <laughs> and I was like, I'm going. I'm not going to have this chance again. And it was hard because I understand exactly what you're talking about, the way that Russians looked at me over there. I've never been looked at like that in my life. It was a type of look that like, they don't even think you're looking back at them. Type of look. It took me about two or three weeks to go on the subway by myself. And this is in a city, St. Petersburg is light 20 hours a day. And I was afraid. And then when the Charlottesville thing happened with the neo-Nazis, I almost had a run in with neo-Nazis in St. Petersburg. So when people were like, oh, like, Oh, this is like an anomaly. I'm like, yo, this is not this is not anything to play with, right? And it's it's hard, I think, just this whole idea of escaping because when you're educated and you read these types of books and you're like, I have to keep thinking about oppression globally and it ain't just about me. Yes. Everything is connected, you know, and the way that someone might esteem me as a black person, what are they doing to black people in their own country? Yes. It's very hard to to sort of balance because traveling is a luxury in and of itself, yeah. to be able to afford to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank, so you. thank you for touching and agreeing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Appreciate that. Were there any other questions? Yes? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. Uh, <laughs> me too. <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask, was there like a certain point that made you realize that you like needed to like look into it more? Because like I'm 18 and like I just, I w I'm here for a fashion school and okay. like just last week I was like no like I want to change everything I want to like learn more about this mm. so like I just wanted to know like did you have a like aha moment that was just like yeah like no yes yes that's a great question I did have like an Oprah-esque aha moment <laughs> um, which I write about in the book so uh, long story short it was when I was in college um, so to Mariam's earlier point like she grew, I think you, we, we've talked before that you grew up in a household where politics were very much part of your life, right? So you're absorbing that at home. I grew up in a home where my mom was like, you know, when people say I don't see color and all that, she was one of them, I don't see yeah. color. You know, she grew up basically right after or through desegregation she, in the South. She never talked to me about any of that. Um, any story she would share about white people would be like really good stories. Like, oh, I had this white teacher, she, you know, she treat me well. And these were like, these are true stories for her. So I didn't grow up in a political household. I didn't grow up learning about race and racism or sexism, any of this. But it was when I went to college, I happened to take a sociology class. I was like, you were gonna study fashion, maybe you still will. I was gonna study biology. 
Uh, I had been doing uh, biochemistry and molecular pharmacology actually in my spare time as a high school student working for um, a university uh, professor. So I came to college to do that. Then I just happened to take a sociology course in my first year. And uh, his name was Dr. Silver. He's uh, still teaching, um, Ira Silver. Took his class, Introduction to Sociology. And, you know, he gave us a book. It's called Ain't No Making It. It's an awesome book. I've used it in my own teaching. It's called Ain't No Making It, Aspirations and Achievement in a Low-Income Neighborhood. And it's all about how some young boys come up against the barriers of race and class, white boys and black boys. And, you know, it gets you to think critically about power, about race and all that. So that class was a huge aha moment. I was like, oh, and this professor, Ira Silver, he's white. Um, Jewish professor, and his class was the one where I learned, wow, like there's a lot going on that I had been protected from knowing about, and it started a lot of interesting conversations with my mom. I was like, mom, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me about all this stuff? And, and we have been over the last one, it's been like, I don't know, like 18 years now since I think that class. Um, as I began to learn about racism, my mom began to share with me more of her own experiences that are mm -hmm. ongoing. Uh, that she had not shared with me. So yes, I had an aha moment. Uh, there have been also other moments along the way uh, that I write about in the book as well. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm reading The New Jim Crow right now. So Excellent. That, wow. that was Excellent. what like, wow. did it for me. Look at you. Like, you're yeah. like years ahead of where I was when, when I was 18. <laughs> so yes, you're on the right path. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. And that doesn't mean you've got to give up fashion, by the way, you know. But you can if you want to. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking into like transferring now. So like I'm going through this whole process. Yes. Wow. Excellent, excellent. I also do want to say that you can change your mind all, you can change your mind over and over again. Yes. Like that's the lesson about being, in, you're you know, 18 and starting out is you're not fixed to anything. And you can change your mind. If you make a, if you make a choice that doesn't sound good anymore, you can do something else. And uh, remind myself about that all the time. Yes. Yes. Hey, um, first I want to once again plug the benefits of sociology undergrad classes. Um, my, it could have been me, aha moment was my freshman year in 2007 when I took a course titled Introduction to the Comparative Study of Race and Ethnicity in the United States and Beyond. I am pretty damn sure that that class taught by a black woman, Dr. Mary Leun of University of Wisconsin-Madison, saved my damn life. Mm. So um, thank God for black women is what I'm trying to say, and may we not burn them all out. Um, that's the comment. The question is, one of the very scary elements of this time, um, even as we understand that it's very much in continuity with so much history is um, the different modalities of action and what can actually be done. Um, I really appreciate in the intro how you make the distinction between um, racist, anti-racist, and perhaps something in between. Um, I thought of like amorality, mm -hmm. so perhaps there is an a-racist, the moderate. Mm. Um, or being apathetic. Right, right of course. And the piece that gets me is, on the one hand, we have the extreme knee-jerk reaction in racism. Yeah. Um, and that's becoming increasingly hyper-violent, hyper-masculine, uh, hyper-racist even. There's this bedazzlement as well. And I felt like on the eve of you know early November 2016 that I had fallen into the bedazzlement mm -hmm. of so many elements, but now that bedazzlement's in this form of being overwhelmed by mm -hmm. the moment. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so, mm. you know, for people of conscience and conviction, yeah. but do still suffer that element of overwhelmingness, yes. what thoughts might all of you have on how we go from there? What's your name? Uh, I'm Joe. So Joe, um, you know, it actually is a nice way of, of connecting to Marianne because when I met you, I was in a very overwhelmed and low place because, you know, I had had some of these aha moments. I had gotten deeper into my study of 
uh, not just critical race theory and what's going on today, but like the history of racism and then the history of oppression. And I was in a, a space where I was just feeling like, you know, just, you know, we all going to hell. Like this thing, this thing is not looking good. It's not going to end well. It's been very bad for a very long time, you know. And I still go there sometimes, you know. I, I think a lot about um, oppression in the long durée of, of human history and also just beyond human history. You know, our species has been in existence for about 200,000 years. Uh, the history of, of modern racism is about 400 years. History of, of patriarchy, as we know it, several thousand years. We could also talk about the history of anti-Semitism. So there, this is where we are after 200,000 years. You know what I mean? This is, this is pretty disturbing. The, the um, horrifying comfort is some days I think, well, we have time. <sighs> well, so when I met Mariam, I was in this low place, feeling overwhelmed. And Mariam, you reminded me, you said something like, well, you have to have a little hope, Crystal, because you're an educator. And I was like, over grits or whatever it was, I was like, then you got a point there. It's true, it's true, I have a little, but, but, but what I took from that also was, you know, and this is what organizers do, y'all do this like your bread and butter. You get folks to look at where you are and, and be pragmatic and, and, and aware of the changes that you can actually make. For me, it's very important not to be, you know, utopian about it because uh, there are all kinds of reasons why racism itself might be a permanent feature of the United States, much less you know, racialized capitalism that has overcome much of the world. Uh, but even if we were to be able to get rid of it, the other forms of oppression that birthed it in the first place don't show any sign of going anywhere. So I don't, and I think it's very important when I teach my students, you know, one of the first things they wanna say, they start to learn about racism, they feel overwhelmed by it. They're like, okay, well, how can we just get rid of it? Like, you know, and there are folks who will hold up banners and say, we can end, you know, racism in our lifetimes or, you know, and no, you can't. But so what can we do? My last chapter, I don't know if you've gotten there yet. Not just yet. Okay. So, that would be a place where I would say, I say, here are some ideas without thinking that we can actually make the United States non-racist, because that's a contradiction in terms, actually, especially when we bring settler colonialism into the forefront of how we think about what is our national project. Um, and I try to do that, come back to that throughout the book. Um, but so what can we do to enjoin the fight against oppression? And I, and I do talk about, um, Martin Luther King gets misread by a lot of folks as just caring about racism, but he was very much, you know, right before he died, very vocal about, you know, the fight against racism has to be connected to the fight against uh, poverty, which is endemic to capitalism, and the fight against militarism. And of course, all of those things are overwhelming, even in isolation, much less. But I think part of what we can do is think about in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our schools, in our institutions, uh, local politics, um, what do you do where you can look at folks around you and say, okay, we've got consciousness raising that we can do, but also we can look at policies. We can, we can challenge specific policies and practices that are perpetuating inequalities and violence. Uh, and we can push for reform. We can look for cases where people have actually made positive change. So things like uh, we charge genocide which uh, you came to Stony Brook, we had Mariam come and talk about this. We can look at cases where people have actually been able to make gains and not just focus on all the shit that doesn't get solved yet because that's not productive, right? We have to look at what gains can we make knowing that oppression is ongoing and not feeling like we have to solve it because we're not going to solve it all. But we can make tangible uh, change. And so the last chapter is a space where I you know, lay out 10 different uh, areas of reflection where I think, you know, folks who are looking for, okay, I'm overwhelmed or I'm, you know, motivated or I want to do something, what can I do? There, there are some suggestions that I make. Thank you. Do you want to chime in or? No, I just, I wanted to say I was thankful for that last chapter because I feel like, and I've seen this with Tanasi Coates' work, people want them him to be overly pessim uh, optimistic, excuse me, and like give, give me some hope and it's like, 
Why? Why? Like after all that I've taught you, so after, after the whole book, you want me to just give you like the huge rainbow at the end. Um, right, and it's like I, there's still so much work to do. So I was really thankful for that last chapter saying, here's what it is. I can't be overly optimistic, but instead of just giving you some fantasy, practical application is key. I also think to me, uh, it's really important to understand, like how long is your life? Do you know what I mean? Like how long do you have here? In the scheme of the world's history, it's almost nothing. So to focus on everything that came before and after and what your hopes for what will come after your death feels to me like fool's errands. I have zero idea if my nieces and nephews' lives are gonna be better or worse than the current situation that we're in. My work is to try to ensure to the extent that I feel like I can in my lifetime, that I've done my very best to at least give them a shot. That's how I measure what's possible in my own life and world. It allows me not to get too caught up in the overwhelming big stuff, to think of where I am and what it's possible for me to shift. So a guy named John Burge, who's a police officer in Chicago who spent 20 years torturing black people, just died today. 70 years old, never, you know, ended up going to prison for four years for all those 120 people that he was responsible with his people to torture, literally torture, not like, I'm not using the term in a euphemistic way. Um, he got four years in prison. That's, I could care less about that, I'm an abolitionist. But, you know, people were just dismayed beyond belief. But what it did was it gave us an opportunity after people had exhausted every other thing talked about prosecution in the system we don't prosecute police and when we do they're not convicted and I don't know how much more people need to see to know that that the system can't actually absorb it mm -hmm. but whatever people keep doing what they do but when people were finally done with that it was like what's possible here that we can do that might be healing for the people who were harmed that became the central focus of our campaign to, for reparations in Chicago, for those torture survivors, and we won. People told us there was no shot. People did not believe it was possible. Because you know what you do as an organizer is your job is to make the impossible possible mm -hmm. to the extent that you can. So I think when we stop looking at things as though they are 200 year windows, mm -hmm. and instead think about them as 50 year windows, mm -hmm. And if we start looking to the people around us and we figure out who our people are and we work with those people to do what we can to reduce the harm for as many people as possible who we can have in our community, I think that's the work. So in this moment of high repression, who are your people? Mm -hmm. And then with those people, what can you do to reduce harm? Mm -hmm. And you do your goddamn best to do those things. Mm -hmm. But you don't ever do them as a lone ranger. Right. You find other people so that they hold you down. When you are feeling at your lowest, you've got other people to turn to who will lift you up for a bit. And when they're feeling low, you're there for them too. I actually feel like this is a time in this moment because things are rough for so many people, we have so many openings. Yeah. We have so many opportunities. People who could care less about shit that I cared about all of a sudden care about it. Right. People I went to high school with who could not I swear to God, I don't think they knew what racism was. All of a sudden on my Facebook page, how can I fucking help? And if I can't help, let me give you money to you, you do the work. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like shit that never occurred yeah. in the 30 years I've been doing organizing. So there's opportunity there too. That's a reason for hope as a practice. In terms of finding your people, that's one of the things I talk about in the last chapter, specifically for white people. If you are a white anti-racist and you want to do something about white supremacy, I mean, common sense but also empirical research has shown that if you, are try, if you try to be a lone ranger, shit's not going to work out very well for you. So one of the most important things white anti-racist or aspiring anti-racist can do is, to Mariam's point, connect with others. Of course, support the work of people of color and black folks who are doing this work, but white folks, because they are the numerical and political majority, the white anti-racists have to band together to oppose the racists who want to maintain the system. 
That's one of the most, imp like identifying who the allies are and, and organizing with them for structural change. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Marianne and Morgan. Honored to be in conversation with you. Thank you so much. And I hope you all appreciate the book.